Welcome to the Tim Booker channel, where wisdom deserves to be spread. Wishing you an enjoyable listening experience. Today, I'll be interpreting The Better Angels of Our Nature for you. This book is approximately 1.24 million words long, and I'll be dividing it into two parts to convey its essence to you. We'll explore six major trends in the reduction of violence, the influence of human nature and societal factors on this decline. Let's delve into the book's perspectives on history and ethics and how they enlighten our present-day society. In this episode, I'll continue for about 22 minutes to discuss the second key point. We'll explore why violence has decreased, and the roles human nature and societal factors have played in this reduction. In the previous episode, we introduced the book and its author, Steven Pinker. Pinker is a psychology professor at Harvard University, and The Better Angels of Our Nature was published in 2011. The book spans multiple disciplines and has received widespread acclaim, providing a unique perspective on understanding the history of morality. In a world where violence and terrorism seem to be escalating, understanding violence can guide us toward a more peaceful future. In the last episode, we looked at six major trends in the reduction of violence throughout human history. Among these trends, we found that violence has decreased across the board, from ancient times to modern societies. According to Pinker's data, violence-related death rates in primitive tribes could reach as high as 15% to 25%, meaning nearly a quarter of the population died due to violence. However, with the advent of nation-states, the average violence-related death rate dropped to 5%. From the late Middle Ages to the 20th century, Europe saw a direct decline of 90% to 98% in homicide rates. Additionally, thanks to movements like the Enlightenment and humanitarian revolutions, public attitudes toward violence underwent significant transformations. In the 20th century, especially after World War II, wars between major nations nearly disappeared, and various forms of armed conflicts became more restrained. In the latter half of the 20th century, the rise of power shifts also led to reductions in domestic violence, bullying, and animal cruelty. Furthermore, in the last episode, we analyzed why we might not perceive the reduction in violence in our daily lives. Pinker pointed out three possible reasons for our misconception. First, cognitive biases, or preconceptions, limit our thinking. Second, our detailed knowledge of recent history can overshadow ancient warfare, which we may know little about. Finally, from a moral psychology perspective, we may feel that violence has increased because our moral standards have improved, and our tolerance for violence has decreased. When we judge historical events by today's standards, we might be surprised to discover the shadow of violence. In summary, we briefly reviewed the key points from the previous episode, which covered the six major trends in the reduction of violence that I end this episode, let's analyze another key point of this book, the role of human nature and societal factors in the reduction of violence, which is also the book's subtitle, Why Violence Has Decreased. Before discussing the factors that restrain violence, we might need to address an unpleasant topic first. With so much violence in the world, is it because human nature is inherently evil, and we have a natural inclination towards violence? There are two extreme answers to this question. One vehemently denies the dark side of human nature, while the other believes in the existence of pure evil. What is pure evil? It's akin to the arch-villains we see in movies. Why are they villains? Because they are bad. This answer may sound illogical, but it's a common perspective among many audiences. For instance, the character of the Joker in the movie, The Dark Knight, epitomizes pure evil. He not only commits heinous acts but also espouses the belief in the inherent wickedness of human nature, striving to drag everyone around him into the abyss of darkness. From organized crime to ordinary people to law enforcement, he manipulates them all according to his twisted logic. He deceives judges, poisons the police commissioner, blows up a hospital, and causes chaos in Gotham City. Why does he do all this? Because he's simply a bad person who enjoys it, with no need for justification. Such characters are common in fairy tales, religious stories, and literature. Denying the dark side of human nature and embracing the concept of pure evil may seem contradictory, but they often coexist, especially when we immerse ourselves in literature, films, or narratives of others' experiences. We tend to empathize with the protagonist or narrator, making their actions understandable, while antagonists often appear as senseless villains. However, if we were to adopt the perspective of the antagonist, we might find their actions justifiable, and the originally positive characters may seem less sympathetic, 
hence the adage, there is some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us. For example, Pinker cites an experimental case where a college student was supposed to help another student with their studies but failed to do so for various reasons, leading to the latter failing an exam. Who is to blame in this situation? The student who failed feels aggrieved, thinking, they promised to help me the day before the exam, but they didn't show up, disrupting my plans. On the other hand, the student who was supposed to help also feels wronged, reasoning, I couldn't make it due to unforeseen circumstances, and besides, studying is their responsibility. If these two students had a common friend, a third party, their description of the situation might lean towards a more impartial perspective, where both parties share blame. This difference in attitudes due to differing stances is known as the moral framing bias. It's a subset of the fundamental attribution error, which means people tend to judge morality differently depending on their position. In recent years, many literary works, movies, and TV shows have aimed to depict deeper aspects of human nature, breaking away from the binary portrayal of good and evil. They delve into multidimensional characterizations of different factions, often exploiting the moral framing bias. Why are we discussing the moral framing bias before delving into the factors contributing to violence in human nature? Because once we recognize the existence of this bias, our perception of many violent events should undergo some re-evaluation. There is no pure evil, and there is no absolute righteousness. While this may sound simple, it's often overlooked when we immerse ourselves in specific events. Only by acknowledging this can we have a more nuanced discussion of the following content. The origins of violence in human nature, as Pinker puts it, are, inner demons. In the previous episode, we mentioned Hobbes's three origins of violence, competition, suspicion, and honor. However, we also noted that this classification doesn't encompass all violent acts. Some acts may not fit into this framework, such as animal cruelty or the kind of thrill-seeking violence prevalent in thrillers. Therefore, Pinker references social psychologist Roy Baumeister's framework, which categorizes violence into five types, referred to as the five inner demons. The first category is predation, a practical form of violence, such as hunting by primitive tribes. The second is dominance, seeking control, similar to Hobbes's concept of competition. The third and fourth roots of violence are sadism and ideology, exemplified by events like genocide, the Crusades, and the French Revolution. The final category is revenge, a popular theme in movies where justice is served as the hero gets even with the villain. On a broader level, revenge serves a functional purpose, deterrence. This concept is mentioned in the science fiction work The Three-Body Problem, where Earth sends a signal of retaliation to an advanced alien civilization, stating that if they invade, both civilizations will be destroyed. In the real world, the tension between two sides during the Cold War was essentially a form of mutual deterrence. The famous, prisoner's dilemma, is a model that describes this scenario. Two prisoners can choose to be loyal to each other or betray each other. Mutual loyalty yields the greatest benefit, while mutual betrayal results in the least benefit. Of course, in everyday life, the adage, an eye for an eye, and promoting revenge is not advisable. Furthermore, due to the moral framing bias, people tend to perceive themselves as having suffered greater harm, leading to more aggressive and irrational retaliation. Alright, that covers our first question, are there roots of violence in human nature? The author identifies five inner demons in human nature. Predation. Dominance. Sadism. Ideology. Revenge. In everyday life, the moral framing bias, which means people adjust moral standards based on their perspective, comes into play. Self-glorification and self-deception lead individuals to deny their own inner demons and project all the evil onto the antagonists, some might say, weren't we supposed to talk about why violence has decreased today? Does this mean our inner demons have gradually disappeared? In fact, inner demons have always existed. The decline in violence is precisely because people are increasingly under the control of their inner demons. The question of which factors have conquered these inner demons is what we are going to address next. In many cartoons, to depict the inner turmoil of the protagonist, a small angel and a small devil are often drawn over the character's head. The bickering between the small angel and the small devil represents the protagonist's inner conflict. Previously, we discussed the dark side of human nature, and now, we'll delve into the benevolent little angels of human nature, the psychological factors that drive humans to abandon violence. 
The author tells us that there are four benevolent angels in human nature guiding us away from the demons and towards peace. The first benevolent angel is what the author calls empathy. What does empathy mean? It's essentially the ability to understand and share the feelings of others, seeing the world through their eyes. The most common manifestation of empathy is sympathy. When we see news reports about kind girls being deceived, we feel anger towards the scammer. When reading Uncle Tom's Cabin, we sympathize with Uncle Tom's plight. Viewing photos of malnourished African children, we feel heartache. In reality, both the kind girl in the news and the hungry African children are distant from us, and Uncle Tom lived centuries ago. This is where empathy, a benevolent angel rooted in our nature, plays a significant role, enabling us to empathize with others suffering and respond accordingly. So, how does empathy guide us away from violence? In the previous season, we discussed the trend of declining violence, and we mentioned that the emergence of humanitarian revolutions in the 17th to late 18th centuries in Europe contributed to the dissolution of forms of violence like torture. Empathy played a role in this transformation. In 1452, Gutenberg invented the printing press, and by the 17th century, advances in printing technology led to a significant increase in book publishing. The variety of books grew, and they became more affordable, resulting in a larger population of readers. Before this, our empathy was confined to our immediate circles, such as relatives or neighbors. However, as we ventured into the world of reading, we gained new insights into the lives and suffering of more people. We empathized with the emotional ups and downs of characters in books, like Tom's struggles in Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom's Cabin sparked the climax of the abolitionist movement, and Oliver Twist forced people to confront the abuse of children. Richard Dana's Two Years Before the Mast and Herman Melville's Moby Dick led to the end of the brutal treatment of sailors. Empathy guided people to recognize a universal humanity transcending all cultures. The identifiable victim effect theory posits that empathy can motivate us to help others. However, empathy is not a flawless angel. Its misuse can sometimes conflict with fairness. If someone exploits emotions to incite, it may lead to adverse consequences. Furthermore, the degree of empathy varies from person to person and depends on their interests and experiences. Relying solely on empathy to save humanity is overly narrow. That's where our second benevolent angel comes in, self-control. This concept is ubiquitous in our lives. To lose weight, we need self-control, managing our diet and exercising. To achieve good grades tomorrow, we need self-control, not playing games. We've heard countless stories about self-control. For example, the grasshopper and the ant fable tells us about the industrious ant who prospers while the carefree grasshopper perishes. Self-control means recognizing the consequences of impulsive behavior and restraining ourselves. However, self-control is easier said than done, especially when temptation is right in front of us. This is where the myopic loss aversion phenomenon comes into play. People tend to change their preferences based on what's immediately in front of them. For example, consider dieting. While planning a diet, we might be strict with ourselves. We go to bed at night and resolve to start eating healthily the next day. But once we find ourselves in front of a dessert shop, it becomes challenging to resist. The strength of self-control varies from person to person. It seems this angel is not always reliable. But don't lose hope. People have been thinking of ways to enhance self-control. One method is to use external cues. In Greek mythology, Odysseus was clever and resourceful. He devised the ingenious strategy of the Trojan horse to conquer Troy. Homer's The Odyssey tells his story. Legend has it that when Odysseus led his fleet through a strait, sirens sang on the shore, luring sailors to steer their ships towards the rocks and devouring them. What did Odysseus do? He didn't blindly trust his self-control, instead, he ordered his sailors to block their ears with wax and tied himself to the mast of the ship, ensuring they safely passed by. In real life, the most common example is getting out of bed in the morning. To wake up early, apart from setting an alarm clock, we also place it far from our reach. Many smartphone apps restricting our phone usage work on the same principle. Another method is psychological. We can divert our attention to avoid the impact of temptation. Moreover, leading a healthy lifestyle can balance our psychology, helping us improve self-control. The third benevolent angel is morality. 
This involves a set of sacred rules or codes that govern human behavior. Actions that violate these rules are considered immoral and are met with disdain from others in the community. However, one might argue that morality is a highly subjective concept that evolves with different individuals and societies. Warring parties may have different moral perspectives. Looking at it this way, while the angel of morality is working hard, it can sometimes yield entirely opposite results. In truth, morality is akin to the golden rule, treat others as you want to be treated. Everyone's wants may differ, but there are some fundamental principles within society that form the basis of morality. Morality exists to address these fundamental issues. Once these issues are resolved, we can discuss distinctions at higher levels. The fourth benevolent angel is reason. Voltaire once said, the absurdity of a thing is no argument against its existence. The presence of reason is to help us recognize absurdity and dismantle the foundations of violence. Furthermore, reason and the other three angels are good friends. Emotions can be subjective, while reason is relatively objective. Empathy may confine us to small circles, but the presence of reason allows us to understand the heights to which caring should rise. Excessive self-control can lead to exhaustion and rebellion, people eventually tire of restraint and long to be themselves. The presence of reason helps people understand the all right, this is the second question we're discussing, what are the factors in human nature guiding us away from violence? Empathy can help us relate to the suffering of others, thereby reducing harm to them. Self-control can make us aware of the consequences of impulsive actions and, in turn, restrain our behavior. Morality serves as a societal yardstick, governing the collective population. Reason allows us to transcend emotional perspectives and guides the other three benevolent angels. However, if the little angels and demons are deeply rooted in human nature, then human history becomes a constant struggle between angels and demons. Why is there a continuous decline in violence? Are there other factors contributing to the efforts of these angels? This brings us to the final question, what historical and societal factors have driven the reduction of violence? The Leviathan is the first societal factor we'll discuss. What is the Leviathan? Originally, it referred to a giant monster. English philosopher Hobbes used it to symbolize a powerful state because the state monopolizes the use of violence, quelling the endless violence in the community. Moreover, the state and judiciary can act as a relatively impartial third party, measuring violent acts by a unified standard and prescribing appropriate punishments, avoiding the adverse effects of moral relativism. In the previous episode on the decline of violence, we mentioned that the emergence of states controlled tribal and small group violence, reducing violent death rates to one-fifth of previous levels. In Europe, when feudal territories merged into sovereign states, the unified enforcement of law further reduced murder rates to one-thirtieth of previous levels. If a state fails, due to poor governance or the overthrow of its leadership, there is a risk of violence resurgence. The second societal factor is the development of commerce. While commercial trade may not have a direct link to violence, trade relations between countries have strengthened global connections, leading to increased shared interests. In this scenario, peace aligns most with mutual benefits. The decline in violence during the 18th century was, in large part, because formerly bellicose nations, like Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, and Spain, gradually transformed into commercial states. Similarly, we can infer that the more a country relies on trade, the less likely it is to engage in war, whereas countries overly reliant on their natural resources are more prone to civil conflicts. The same principle applies to individuals, more shared interests mean less likelihood of violent disruption of relationships. In today's globalized world, the fates of various nations are intertwined, sometimes making trade sanctions more effective than violence. This is one reason the author maintains an optimistic outlook on world peace. The third point is the rise of feminism. Conventionally, people might assume that males have a greater inclination toward competition and violence, while females lean more toward family and nurturing instincts. The rise of feminism represents society's gradual recognition of the value of women. The improvement of women's status also signifies an increase in societal civility. This ties back to the first two points, robust states and commerce are markers of civilized societies. Only when society reaches a certain level of development can it contemplate issues of equality. In such a society, honor cultures associated with male-related violence become less admired, and violence correspondingly decreases. Finally, 
two factors directly impact the benevolent angels of human nature, aiding them in defeating the demons and steering people away from violence. Empathy, this benevolent angel, plays a significant role in reducing violence. Associated societal factors include the rise of cross-cultural norms, higher education levels, urbanization, increased mobility, and media development. People are starting to realize that the world is filled with different yet similar individuals. They live different lives, experiencing various joys and sorrows. Originally, they were strangers, and we had no emotional connection to them. However, today, reading their stories and seeing their images make everything more relatable and empathetic. Cross-cultural norms, education, and other factors also lead to an increase in reason. The expansion of knowledge allows people to break out of their existing mindsets and think on a higher plane. Urbanization, mobility, and the development of mass media bring about the collision and fusion of different ideologies. In this process, reason is like stepping onto an escalator, continually ascending. People recognize the drawbacks of the violence cycle and can genuinely reassess violence and reflect upon it, all right, with that said, today's content is similar to what we've shared so far. Let's summarize briefly one more time. First, we discussed whether there are factors of violence in human nature. The author summarized five inner demons, appetite, dominance, sadism, ideology, and revenge. It's worth noting that people often change their judgment of violence due to different perspectives, leading to what's called moral relativism. The existence of this deviation may affect our attitude toward inner demons and our perception of violence. Next, we talked about the factors within human nature that prevent these inner demons, which are our four benevolent guardians, empathy, self-control, morality, and reason. Empathy allows us to see issues from others' perspectives, feel their suffering, and thus reduce harm to them. Self-control makes us aware of the consequences of violence, enabling us to control our behavior. Morality is a societal contract and norm that can constrain a group, while reason allows us to rise above and contemplate issues from a higher standpoint. Finally, we discuss the societal factors that have led to a decrease in violence. The emergence of the state monopolized the use of violence, restricting violent conflicts among the populace. Moreover, the state, as a neutral third party, can effectively prevent moral relativism. The development of commercial trade has increased shared interests between nations, making peace a mutual pursuit. The rise of feminism signifies society's respect for women and implies an increase in societal civility. Factors like education levels and urbanization have aided both empathy and reason. Empathy's circle has expanded, and people now have sympathy for those far away. Reason has been elevated through reading and communication, fostering rational contemplation of violence. Pinker, in the conclusion of his work, responded to those who questioned him. He openly admitted that reviewing the history of violence is quite painful. Behind the numbers and charts are individual lives and shattered families. However, what's heartening is the ultimate conclusion of the work, the continual reduction of violence. This includes the shining aspects of human nature and the contributions of society and its systems. Beyond recognizing violence itself, we should cherish the power of civilization and enlightenment. If we become complacent, violence could resurge. Alright, that covers the main content of this book. Congratulations, you've completed another book. Thank you for your support and attention. Please subscribe to the Tim Booker channel. Like and share with your family and friends because wisdom deserves to be spread. Let's open the door to a brighter future. Thank you, and goodbye.